perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Medtronic actually played a very critical role during this COVID-19 crisis, and uh, we would like to hear exactly what happened and your leadership uh, during that time. But also, I want to understand first the mission, vision, and values of the organization, because they played a very critical role during that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Please. Well, yeah. Um, you know, first, um, we only contributed, frankly, a small amount because uh, uh, this is a huge pandemic and we did our very best. But uh, it was really in areas that we have a presence in. Uh, but on top of that, our own employees were pretty high on the priority list to make sure that they were safe and protected. And that was our number one priority. And then following that, our priority was to make sure that uh, products, either COVID related or not, because all our products um, are life-saving in some way, that production could be maintained. So people with other conditions, if they needed help from us could get that. So that was our priority. Now, that goes back to the mission question that you asked. Um, Medtronic is very fortunate in the sense that we have a mission that was written in 1960. And I won't go on through it all, but um, there are six tenets to the mission, but the, but, but the mission inspires almost everyone in, uh, everyone in Medtronic. It unites everyone, and it also guides the way in which it works. And the mission, essentially, the, the opening tenant of the mission, which virtually every employee of 90,000 employees of Medtronic could recite at any minute anywhere in the world, it essentially says that we're a biomedical engineering company and we use that technology to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. And that is, uh, in many ways, certainly uniting because, like I said, everybody in Medtronic knows those three words, those three kind of phrases. It's inspiring because we're doing something that makes a big difference to people. and But more equally important, it actually gives us guidance as to what type of company we are. We're a medical company, we're a biomedical engineering company, and we use that technology to change outcomes of patients, alleviate pain, restore health, or extend life. We're not a diagnostics alone company. We will not build things that only do diagnostics because that will not alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. Now, we do diagnostics, but whenever we do it, there's a direct line of sight to a treatment. So in other words, I find that you have a problem, and then you get referred, and you get treated, and you get better. So it gives us a certain uh, guidance as to how we, uh, a strategic guidance as to how we operate as a company, which we don't have, you know, sort of uh, brainstorming sessions every time there's a, there's a new leader somewhere, and uh, and go through this. this is a mission statement that was written, like I said, 60 years ago, and nothing has changed. Uh, so applying that to COVID was pretty straightforward. Um, you know, how do we use our technology to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life? And that's very pertinent to COVID. Um, and I can talk more about that. But that's essentially the backdrop yeah. of Medtronic. Thank you. Thank you. During this time, of course, you, I mean, you focused on employees first, uh, the business continuity and also communities. But I know that you and your team work with the country presidents, state governors, uh, while working with the employees and public. So what was the process like and what kind of decision making skills did you use as a leadership team? Well, yeah, let me walk you through that. Um, the, the place where in the early phases of the crisis, um, the, the place where there was the biggest need, uh, or at least perceived need, and the biggest visibility was in the need for ventilators, which became a big public concern. And, uh, and we are one of the major manufacturers of ventilators. And so we uh, were uh, asked to produce ventilators at quantities that we just couldn't produce. So there's no way in which uh, we had a business producing, um, you know, something like a thousand ventilators a month, and we were asked to generate like 20,000 for New York. So, you know, like overnight. So th that's just not possible. And then a ventilator, just to give you a backdrop, there's, the word is used very commonly and interchangeably, but uh, there's a high acuity ventilator, which is a very sophisticated product, uh, which is used uh, in intubated patients. And it essentially takes over the function of the lung. It, uh, the lung is there, but it kind of uh, 
puts oxygen into the lungs and the exhalation, uh, the level of carbon dioxide exhalation is also kind of controlled in a, in, a, in a certain way. And so that is an automated device and fairly and very sophisticated, not only from a technology perspective, but also from a usage perspective too. You have to have clinical specialists who know how to use that. So that's the high acuity, acuity ventilators. You've got lower acuity ventilators, which are not used in critical care settings, uh, but still used, and they're, they're also intubated. And then you go all the way to simple oxygen masks and forced air oxygen, which sometimes got confused as ventilators. But the ventilators that Medtronic is uh, really uh, making are the are these high acuity uh, ventilators mostly. And so just clarifying that, the way I phrased it was a good start because, you know, some governor or politician, you know, they didn't know the difference between one kind and another kind, so clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And second, we tried to then uh, figure out, well, um, you know, there's such a need, but we can only make so many. And in fact, others can also only make so many. So what do we do? So we had uh, two or three broad initiatives that we took into place. And again, the problem here that we were trying to solve was uh, here are patients who need it and we don't have enough. So what do we do? And we're doing our very best to increase our own manufacturing this is the first thing that we did. So we had a program plan in place to double, triple, quadruple our manufacturing, but you can't do that overnight. You need supplies, you need components, you need space. And But we put a plan together. And right now, for example, in the last, uh, this thing whole started in March, and we now have uh, production levels approaching four times what we had in March because of that process. But that's a that's an eight week period, eight to 12 week period. Um, but but we started that process, which was in our control. The other thing that we did is we immediately said that, look, we've got to prioritize. So we worked with uh, uh, the administration and other governments and said that, uh, you know, let's move the ventilator to places of greatest need. And then we will move it to other places as the need kind of drifts because this pandemic was speaking in different areas. It was in Europe, then moved to New York and other places. So we wanted to move it from place to place. That was one one goal and prioritize that. The other thing that we did at the same time is we didn't want there to be any confusion in anybody's mind that we were prioritizing because of price or some stuff like that. So we immediately took a 15% discount of our, of our price and fixed it for everybody. So we didn't even talk about price. This is the price, this is, this is not a high price, it's a lower price than normal and it's fixed. And so that we took that off the equation. And really the prioritization became the most important thing in addition to that, we had some demo units, which we used as a loaner pool. And that's the way in which we worked with governors, with FEMA, with the administration in trying to figure out prioritization. And in the end, we, uh, when we had no other kind of response, we adopted the University of Washington model and used it by ourselves uh, when no one else was giving us guidance and we would see where the greatest need is and we would prioritize the shipment. So that was an important step that we take, which was not an ordinary step. The other thing that we did, the third big um, sort of initiative, was to open source the product. In other words, one of our products uh, we said, which was a little simpler to make, we said that, look, we just can't make enough of these. So we invited anyone in so, uh, else in the world to, to do this. And we open sourced the product, and there were like 200,000 downloads of that product. And essentially that, in the end, became a forum where we created some very valuable partnerships with uh, Foxconn being one group uh, that you know, Taiwan based, Bayless, which is Canadian based, Vin Group, which is uh, Vietnamese based, and then uh, one or two others. And, and through these partnerships, um, which has taken a while, but right now we have a facility in Milwaukee, for example, uh, through Foxconn, that is on the cusp of producing ventilators for US production. And right now uh, there's a need uh, the U.S. aid is actually sending ventilators out to some countries, and uh, some of that will come out of that facility. Vin Group uh, in Vietnam actually has made a very important component for us that we were having trouble with scaling. And so these partnerships have become uh, things that I think will be long term. It will change the nature of our ventilator business in the long term because of, the, of what we went through in the last eight weeks. So uh, let me just conclude by saying that, uh, you know, leadership is about... Um, um, doing things that haven't been done before, pointing a certain direction and not hesitating and, and figuring out through a set of basic principles what to do. Mm -hmm. Here are the principles and then lead. And look, you only lead if others follow. That means others do what you say to do. Otherwise, you're not a leader. And mm -hmm. so uh, 
our principles were really guided in our mission. And the mission, I only named one of them, but there are six tenants all the way from taking care of employees to being a good social citizen and all this other stuff, making a fair profit, mm -hmm. all of them, as you can see, were embedded in the actions that we took. So that those were our guiding principles and applying those guiding principles without hesitation is what leadership is all about. Thank you, thank you, very helpful. So what I heard uh, in my words will be prioritize. You talked a lot about prioritization. Uh, yeah. You also clarified, I think, some critical points like pricing, which is no debate, you know, here it is based yeah. on your values. So this is not a playing ground. Yeah. And then also, yeah. exactly. And also internally, I think the manufacturing, the speed of manufacturing, innovation there was important, logistics, but also partnerships. So yeah. yes. I think that that gives a, a lot of, I think, good ground for our audience today who are really looking forward to some crisis management guidance. But during this time, you had also some hard decisions to make, I'm sure, tough decisions. And what kind of innovative thinking uh, came out of those moments? You know, what, what, is, um, what we found uh, was um, it wasn't hard. It was clear. We had to do it, and so we did it. In fact, it was easier than at times when you have many choices. I think in my personal view, the, the partnerships uh, through the open sourcing is a game changer that will change the way in which we think about partnerships. Because what I learned through this, and we learned, is that by doing the open source, you create an atmosphere of trust and draw people in who want to work with you. And then you get to work before you think about agreements. We just got to work. You know, I remember the call with Foxconn for the first time with Terry Gu, who's the founder and, and the chairman of uh, Foxconn. And the very first call was not about, you know, uh, some kind of uh, agreement document and all that. It was about, look, people are dying in New York. We need to make more ventilators quickly. How do we put our best people together and drive it? And Terry and I were on video cons every day. It was night for me, morning for him, every day for at least two weeks to get our teams to work together. Not because we were telling them exactly what to do. They knew what to do. We were just uh, there interested and in trying to help um, resolve any issues or come out with our own ideas. Um, and so this uh, cross-company and cross-country uh, partnership that happened because of a common sense of purpose, I think we've got to learn from that, that uh, create a common sense of purpose and get to work. And don't worry about, you know, who's going to get what and all these things, because the common purpose, mm -hmm. if you achieve that, we'll both win. And that's all you worry about. And get to work. And then and then in the end, I think we've created a partnership with Foxconn that'll, be, that'll go way beyond the pandemic. We've created a US manufacturing facility for ventilators. We've created an engineering relationship between sets of engineers who didn't even know each other that'll create new products and new innovation. And the same is true with the Vietnamese group in, in Vin Group. And so that to me was the biggest learning that uh, that we had that in Medtronic within the company, but this the common purpose can go beyond beyond company boundaries. And if you put that first, I think you can create all kinds of new innovative ideas that uh, that uh, we haven't done before. We've been too slow and too kind of worried about you know who gets what and create agreements and all these things. And by the time all that happens, uh, it's too long. I think sometimes the a crisis brings that purpose and the speed to action. Yes. I believe yeah. for for most companies yeah. and governments. Yes. So, who was in the room uh, making those decisions? Of course, uh, you were there. Your I mean your leadership team. But I'm really interested yeah. in uh, the diversity of the team making these decisions, bringing different points of view and how important it was during that time of crisis management? I, I think having a, um, having a, a broad-based team with different functions without any real concern about hierarchy. Get to the people who know the content and they're in the room, in the room working with you. So hierarchy took a backseat. So it was me, it was Jeff Martha, who's currently CEO, who was at that time president, and then it was the two of us. And um, and it was the uh, the head of, uh, for example, our respiratory business. But it was also the engineering manager for respiratory. It was the production people. 
It was our government affairs people who knew the different governments. It was our communications people who knew how to how to broadcast the communication outwardly because it was you know you to be communication here was not just uh, uh, for you know telling the world what you're doing. It's also so that we don't miscommunicate. I mean, the simple fact about uh, you know there was a lot of noise around this social media, you name it. And the last thing I wanted is to be caught up in some place where someone writes something and says, "Hey, Medtronic is just doing this for price." And so we had a discussion. Say, I want that off the table. It doesn't matter. And this is what we're going to do. And then we're going to communicate that, and that's off the table. It's easy to say now, but to think that through required multiple perspectives of people with different backgrounds: a communications expert, uh, you know, a, a business leader, um, you know, the, sort of our own internal documentation. How do you suddenly make you know the product the same price from everybody when it has different sort of things in it and we have historical prices very different. How do we communicate to our own commercial people? So all of this requires a depth of participation that is important. So you've got to get that entire um, group together. And the most important thing is get who you need and forget hierarchy. You cannot, in a time of crisis, you cannot go to a manager and then he comes back to you a day later and says, yeah, I talked about my people and here's the answer. You gotta to go to the decision makers and the experts immediately and, and move as quickly as you possibly can. And then everyone plays a role in that people in, the, we have daily meetings, two hour meetings, and we still have every, yeah. you know, twice a week uh, meetings, which I participate in, where we get upgrades because we're taking this thing and now, you know, this crisis is not over. And the shortage of ventilators, although in the U.S. we're stable, outside the U.S. in emerging markets, it's still a massive problem. And so we've done through these partnerships sort of uh, uh, arrangements through which we can supply to other countries. We've also come up with other, we've talked about ventilators, but we've also got this uh, respiratory monitoring uh, technology, which we think is critical to actually avoid people from getting into ventilators, to do early care when they first go into the hospital. We're trying to scale that across the world where where the, cl the clinical staff to patient ratio is very low. I mean, lots of patients and few staff. We have unique examples we're going after. And again, there, um, it's me, it's the engineering leaders who know the solution. It's the local country people who know the country. And uh, we get on calls together and work this out directly uh, because we have a problem at hand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the expertise and also the, the hierarchy taking a back seat. And we, we also yeah. know that um, throughout your career, you cared a lot about diversity of teams also in other ways, yeah. like bringing gen gender yeah. and also other yeah. ethnicity representation. So, uh, I mean, how did you build those teams and what was the driving force? I mean, why did you believe in this as a leader? Well, you know, I mean, this this um, um, concept is not unique to me, but it is one that I uh, I kind of learned over time. Uh, you know, um, I, I discovered um, um, through a variety of different experiences as I start to you know grow in management and leadership and so on. Variety of different exper uh, experiences that that diverse thought leads to better solutions. Because people from uh, different uh, countries or different backgrounds or different ethnicities or even gender um, have a different perspective. And if you apply that perspective to make a decision, multiple perspectives, you usually make a better decision. So um, because you just have more points of view. And, and I can tell you that, the, um, that a business is really a collection of thousands of decisions that are made every day. That's, that's what a business is, not just by me, but by people throughout the company. Everyone, every day, whatever they're doing is making a decision to do something, ordering a part, designing a part or doing something, selling somebody, deciding what to price things at, decide whatever they're doing, everybody, every one of our employees is making some kind of decision every day. The quality of those decisions when integrated will result in how good the company is. If I make a higher percentage of good decisions versus bad decisions, I will have a better company. It's just as simple as that. So uh, the quality of a company in the end rests on the quality of the decisions that are made every day collectively across the whole organization. If you then believe that a decision is better, if it's made with multiple perspectives versus a singular perspective, 
then the concept of diversity becomes pretty apparent. So if you have diverse thought, diverse thinking, going into every decision every day, then you will get a better company. So this is not me as a company leader saying, I want so many of this and so many of that. That is, that is, that actually doesn't work. It has to be, it has to be in depth within the company. The diversity of thought has to be at every decision. It has to be natural. And by the way, what's the other thing that you need to make a decision in a collaborative way? You need inclusion. So I can have a diverse mix, but if no one ever talks to each other, I don't get the diverse perspectives. So inclusion and diversity go together. Inclu diversity is useless without inclusion. And, uh, and so the, those are the thought processes that have evolved over time. And so I've certainly become a, a, a real uh, committed and impassioned believer in the importance of diversity, of multiple perspectives. And, and I just don't mean gender and ethnicity. Those are big ones. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, uh, you know, your background, where you worked, uh, where do you come from, all of those things. Um, and then, then the final thing I'll say is that uh, as we've um, uh, tried to, uh, to implement diversity, uh, we found that, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the barriers to be, to be overcome are different depending on what type of diversity you want to, you're weak in and you want to broaden. Um, you know, we, the, the African American issue in the US, um, the way we address that is different from, say, the Latinx issue in the US. The backgrounds are different. The history is different. You can't have a, or, or an East Asian or a South Asian um, presence in the U.S. or gender, for that matter, in the U.S. These are different, and and yeah. e each are equally important. All of them together will create the value. But you can't take like one kind of checkbox and say, "I've done this. I, I'm going to, you know, just do everything the same." It's it's got to. You have to understand the in-depth perspective as to why there is a certain level of uh, minority participation, and and you've got to address that problem. Um, in the U.S. today, yeah. for example. Uh, uh, fifty percent of medical school graduates, uh, medical school entrants and graduates are Asians. Fifty percent. So the approach that I take in healthcare, in the healthcare community, to an Asian minority versus an African American minority is different. It doesn't mean I don't do I do one over the other. I do both, but I can't go in there with the same recipe. It's going to be a different recipe, and and I think that is very important. That and the importance of inclusion, the the respect yeah. that each area of diversity needs its own thought, its own understanding of clarity, and the importance of inclusion are the two big takeaways that I want to leave. Uh, and to be clear I, about why you do it. That you can't yeah. just say it because I want to hit a number. It's why. You have to be crystal clear about that. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, the purpose, again, is coming clearly in education, because if you don't understand the differences between those groups, we can't approach in the right yeah. way. Uh, before moving into the participant questions, my last question will be, we have some early and mid-career professionals uh, with us uh, in the yeah. participants yeah. group. So uh, what kind of leadership skills and how do you develop them early on uh, to manage a crisis or lead a crisis? So what are the areas like maybe top three uh, advice for them? Well, you know, um, I think um, have a clear um, sense of purpose and a value proposition. Have a sense of purpose and you know what you want to do. Don't be confused about that. And then be clear about what's right and what's wrong. And don't, don't ever be confused about that because what's right is usually pretty clear. Basic values that humanity has as a whole is usually pretty, pretty clear, okay? You know, tell the truth, have integrity, follow the law. I mean, things are pretty basic, which we as individuals, uh, embrace and we should as a collective embrace uh, mm -hmm. basic basic principles so have those principles and through that know what you what value what you want to do and then what value specific value you're creating you have to understand that and then build around that build around that and um, and and don't worry about um, you know prioritize the value first and the action that follows that that requires you to achieve that value next negotiating how much you get paid for it what your title is 
who does what, that'll happen. Don't get hung up on that. That stuff will happen. Do the work. If you do the work, you'll get the credit. If you start to negotiate, hey, I'm not going to participate because I want a better title before I talk to you. That's I, sometimes it works, but that's not, this is not my approach. Get the work done. Yeah. Everything else will follow. Have clear sense of principles. Have uh, understand how you're contributing, and just do it. That, that that's the advice that I'd give everybody. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I will just check with Meredith if we have questions from the participants. Uh, Meredith. Okay, I think I am just going to ask a final question before we hit our. Uh, basically time with this session. Uh, I mean, given your background, you know, where you were grown up and then moving into another yep. country and making a life here. Um, I mean, you had, I am sure, you know, the highs and the lows throughout this uh, period. And what did you keep going in those tough or hard moments? Like, you know, you had to, you had to believe in something. So what was that? Well, I, I think um, a number of uh, basic uh, principles. Um, the um, uh, in always think that I always have a view that uh, that others are good first. Whoever you're dealing with, even if someone offends you in some way, assume it's unintentional before you assume it's intentional. Assume that that was a mistake because of their perspective, because they don't know and they really mean well. Start with that. Don't start with, you know, getting angry because someone said something. So start with seeing good in people rather than bad in people. That's a basic principle you've got to start with, always. And I, with that, trust others before mistrusting them. This is not being casual about everything. I mean, obviously, you've got to have certain levels of you know common sense mm -hmm. but essentially uh if you if you assume that people are good before they're bad over time the balance of good that you will get will be more so that that uh, is the main thing that i want to leave with you that uh, think that way and and don't assume that um that, that someone's out to get you always the other thing that i'll say is that and I think I mentioned that if someone gives you a hand mm -hmm. to help you, to give you a chance, take it. To me, there were three or four people who made big bets on my career. The first person was a person called Jim Pisa, who I know very well, who lives in California, who was my first boss. He hired me out of school in England for a job in California. He didn't have to do that. He did. If he hadn't given me, put his hand out, I wouldn't be where I was. I wouldn't have achieved anything of what I did. Then there was, uh, there was, uh, you know, Jack Welch. Uh, he uh, brought me into GE. Uh, again, GE at that time never even uh, hired people of that level from outside. Put his hand out and I grabbed it. The Medtronic Board of Directors, uh, who had never hired a CEO of Medtronic from outside of Minnesota. Forget about someone from Bangladesh who worked in GE and, and all this stuff. They put their hand out and say, I'll give you a shot. I grabbed it. And in all of these situations, it wasn't that the uh, that I didn't leave something behind, that I didn't take a bit of a chance. But I saw an interesting opportunity where I could do something and someone was putting their hand out, you got to grab it. So if someone puts their hand out, grab it. And then as you become a leader, you put your hand out and pull others through the system. So those are yeah. some principles that I really want to do uh, with the audience here. And I hope... Um, Hope you can use it in your own Thank way. Thank you. And find Absolutely. Thank you, Omar, for joining us today, but also your leadership during the COVID-19 crisis. And also thanks to the leadership team working with you. All the best. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure and uh, uh, to talk to you and for your great questions. And sorry for the mix up in the beginning. I was a little late, but uh, hopefully okay. we, we, had a, we had a very interesting session. So thank you. Keep well. Bye-bye.